Uh, welcome, everyone. I, I'm excited to have you all here at the cutting edge of philanthropic capital pooled donor funds for impact investing. And as founder and executive director for strategic development and impact assets, I'm pleased to welcome you to the conversation here with three founders you see on the screen here. Uh, Gina Klein of Smart Job Fund, Derek Morgan of Hometown Fund, I Am Nation and Kingdom Group, and John uh, Mulliken of Carbonware Labs. And I'm not going to do like a whole bio thing. I'll spare everybody that. You might slip a few tidbits into your um, descriptions of your work, but uh, just a, a little headline item. You know, Gina's been a high-powered lawyer championing the rights of people with disabilities. Derek, in addition to being a venture partner, uh, also is an NFL linebacker with the Tennessee Titans. I think that's pretty noteworthy. Uh, John, the CTO of Wayfair. So you all got like a, uh, a checkered past filled with all sorts of, um, of fun stuff. Um, but what what we've got here today is um, a really diverse group of innovators bringing catalytic capital to cutting edge impact investing themes. And um, just flash this disclaimer here for a second to mention we're not selling securities in this conversation today. Um, and that impact assets only organizes the types of programs discussed here for donor purposes or for program related investments from foundations. Just uh, those are the cliff notes on that incredibly dense uh, disclaimer slide there. And uh, to start off, I want to kind of scene set on donor advised funds, aka DAFs, people may have heard them referred to as. Um, they've approached $150 billion as a segment in the philanthropic endowment space. And they take in cash and other asset donations, including all types of appreciated securities. And they give tax deductions upfront to donors for the purposes of making grants to end charities and other charitable projects uh, over time. And they give donors much of the functionality of a private foundation, uh, but do so with kind of a benefit of that significant scale of a common platform where everybody's getting together in a community. Um, they invest those assets before the end grant making to charities or the project work. Uh, but our thesis here today, which will be reflecting certainly that of impact assets, is that they are largely an untapped market segment for catalytic capital and impact investing. And um, they really mostly are sitting in the mattresses of the markets and not doing a heck of a lot of proactive good in the world. So we believe strongly it's time for what I would say is a kind of a widespread movement, an upswell of support towards increase in creative impact investing in DAFs. And um, we've given them the tax deduction. We think that they should be uh, be uh, moved quickly and, and, and affirmatively towards uh, high impact gap filling strategies in the United States and throughout the world, in fact. Um, kind of at the bottom here, Impact Assets, just a minute on it. It's a firm I founded about 11 years ago, uh, spun out of Calvary Impact Capital, and, uh, where I was for like a decade before that. And it's a nonprofit firm with more than $1.6 billion in donor advice funds from about 1,700 families and institutions. Um, and it's built completely upon impact investing. It's made 100, uh, sorry, it's made 700 private debt and equity investments into funds and companies and community development and microfinance institutions, and actually did 200 of those just in 2020. So that's about four per week that we're doing out of impact assets, donor advice funds, um, pushing towards one per every business day of the year. Um, and we're going to be at about 100, uh, 100 more maybe before the end of the year and might even break 1,000 uh, by the end of the year. We've kind of built about the largest institutional portfolio in the U.S. by number, at least, of impact investments under one roof. So what are we talking about today? We're going to be walking through this pooled donor fund model and, um, and one that's focused on impact investing and strategic projects where innovative leaders like the folks who join me on this call are able to leverage this off the shelf architecture uh, to create really fast strategic constructs that have deep impact capabilities. And this allows impact investing infrastructure to be kind of rapidly created to benefit almost anything you can imagine from climate solutions to equity and opportunity for any target group. The examples on this call today uh, will be outlining in some depth uh, how, how they uh, translate that to their work. And if you look at this graphic flow, basically, you have contributions from individual DAF accounts and new contributions from multiple donors can all be pulled into one tax deductible donor fund. Multiple donors can contribute uh, basically at any level, $10 credit card uh, fees, uh, credit card um, uh, donations or multi-million dollar grants. 
can all be put into the same pool. And uh, that allows these, these pooled assets to then be put into investments uh, into a whole range of private debt and equity funds and companies, loans to nonprofits, and also program uh, program expenditures in pursuit of a charitable thesis. And by partnering with DAF sponsors like Impact Assets, initiatives that are seeking to raise capital can provide existing and new supporters kind of this way to invest with tax deductible philanthropic dollars through a pooled fund. And um, it's it's something that we started playing around with maybe six or seven years ago, sort of anecdotally. And last year, we actually um, launched a few initiatives, one around COVID-19, one around uh, wildfire resilience, and one about uh, racial equity and economic opportunity, uh, sort of test out the architecture a bit, but we've opened it up to work with what is already just this year turned into about a dozen uh, initiatives in the last, well, maybe through Q4 of last year, um, three of which are represented here. And uh, we're going to hear a bit more from them in just a minute. But th the real power of this model, I think, is that there's there's really no setup costs. Like there's no time to market building, structuring. It's it's all just like right out of a box. It's kind of elegant architecture for impact investing. And um, we're excited to to sort of do our part to try to popularize this for the industry and and work with amazing partners like those um, uh, that we're going to hear from in a minute. And um, and I think we've got a lot of uh, a lot of use cases here that we can kind of plumb, um, and we're going to hear from three of them. And I think I just say, as as we're uh, talking through these models, I uh, really encourage you to put some questions into the chat box thing there. And uh, also uh, just kind of like let it swirl around in your head and, and think about like, you know, what is what ideas does this give you for the things that you care about, the initiatives or organizations you're involved with, or as funders? Like what what excites you to fund in this kind of a model, including the three groups um, that are that are joining us here uh, on this panel. So let me pass it over to you, Gina. I think we're going to cold call you first and let you walk through Smart Job. And I have a couple slides you've graciously uh, sent in. So why don't Great. you take it away? Thank you, Tim. And you know, Tim, we're so grateful to be included on this panel with such other tremendous panelists, but also just to be included in the conference. So thank you. Um, I, I'm the founder and CEO of Smart Job, which is a new platform um, that is dedicated to leveraging impact investment to close to close the disability wealth gap, which is a relatively new vertical. I know it's new to the impact assets platform, and we're so happy to be working with Tim in this type of structure. It's exactly the structure that um, the disability market needs in order to find signal in the market, to test the market. Um, let me back up and say I spent the first 15 years of my career as a plaintiff's attorney representing workers with disabilities and at the Department of Justice uh, enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I went all over the United States representing workers. And the problem, the unique problem that we have here and that we collectively, including our 13 board members who represent uh, some of the most um, uh deeply track record leaders across disability and the disability groups that we work with every day. What the problem we're trying to solve is one of a disability unemployment crisis. There's nearly two thirds of working age people who have disabilities in the world who are not working. Um, that's you know nearly roughly half of those that live in long-term poverty in the United States are people with disabilities. We're talking about more than 40% of the same population unbanked, underbanked. So we're talking about really deeply embedded and historic uh, inequality and particularly separation from the labor market. The thing that is um, very interesting about the pandemic in the last 18, 19 months is that we are experiencing a tremendous and historic disruption to work that should ostensibly play to the favor of workers with disabilities, because after all, they were the very first people in the world to demand flexible and remote work. And yet they've had such a conspicuous absence from the labor market and from venture capital and from traditional avenues of risk capital and investment that they are not participating in the gains of the economic recovery. It's an uneven recovery. These are the first workers in the world to be fired during the pandemic and the last to be rehired. 
So there's nearly a 60% uh, group of people in, in the labor market who are uh, designated as low and moderate income that have that have disabilities. What we're doing at Smart Job is we are sourcing uh, the the greatest ideas that we can find in the world, Tim, that fall into four impact categories, and we're sourcing them to this pooled fund as various opportunities for upskilling and reskilling work as applied to disability to support and allocate philanthropic grant capital, to make recommendations to deploy grant capital to those accelerators and incubator programs around the world that are led by disability and disability entrepreneurs, to deploy catalytic capital to the next generation of work-related technologies that will allow people with disabilities to join the future of work, but it will also allow their designs, which are catered to universal design to serve other workers without disabilities, um, but to really drive tremendous changes in the way and the modes of working. And then the final category of investment that we're really interested in sourcing deals for is seeding underrepresented founders with disabilities. Uh, and these are founders that have tremendous ideas um, and that lack access to traditional capital. The, um, you know, Tim is showing a diagram. The essential uh, structure of our fund, the reason I said it was very beneficial to be working with impact assets in this particular pooled style fund is, is helpful and useful, is that we, we are often confronted in conversations with um, showing a use case for the tremendous signal in the disability market. And this is allowing us the experimentation and both, both us and our donors the experimentation in the market as between things that um, would be targets of investment for traditional capital, but just have been overlooked versus things that are truly um, where traditional capital would not go. It is it, the structure of this is allowing us to take those educated risks and to do it with uh, within the rubric of measuring upward mobility for this workforce. When we're talking upskilling and reskilling workers, we're talking about the types of credentials that workers are not getting from public workforce systems around the world. Um, civil societies around the world have a multi-billion dollar spend country by country on workforce development for people with disabilities. It's vastly overrepresented in spend on manual skills training. What we're doing with one of our four categories is we're trying to find targeted investments in the type of upskilling that will materially change the entry-level wage of workers with disabilities. And we've seen quite a lot of opportunities just in the little while that we've been uh, doing business in that area of upskilling. We're also looking at truly tremendous innovators around the world. We've talked to and worked with hand-in-hand -hand with accelerators around the world at this point who have really perfected this idea of disability as innovation, not as deficit or as a medical model. There is something that is inherently um, uh, unique to the design thinking capabilities of people who solve problems every day uh, to get through the front door, to access a building, to, to, um, to un undergo uh, activities of daily life with support. There's a design thinking feature that creates universally designed products and services. It's truly something I want to put a, a big asterisk around. Uh, when we look at the consumer spend of people with disabilities worldwide, we're talking about between eight and ten trillion dollars, which has been assessed by an economic uh, economic evaluation just came out of Canada uh, that was discussing this is roughly the size of China and the European Union in terms of the disposable spending power of this group. And yet technologies have not been ideated or designed with this group in mind historically. So we're looking to leverage, we're not only testing the market uh, with the catalytic potential of a pooled fund, which achieves scale, but we're also testing the designs that would be purchased by that really robust market that's looking for new consumer technologies um, at work. And we know everybody's looking for the infrastructure around work right now to make it more flexible. This diagram in particular is showing that we have an evergreen feature to the fund, which is essentially allowing us to deploy the capital um, 
make recommendations to impact assets, I should say, for, for the deployment of capital. But when there is upside on, uh, for instance, a venture deal or an equity investment, it rolls back into the fund in order to multiply the initial charitable contribution and spread the effect of that contribution to more more and more entrepreneurs. So it has this unique built-in feature of an evergreen fund out of a DAF. It also has the unique attribute as donors are involved for them to experiment. The, you know, the, the unique timing of the contribution is separated from the idea of smart job advising, providing donor counseling to build a portfolio and a plan, a giving plan providing the information, sourcing the greatest ideas in the world that will materially impact employment, uh, labor market participation, but allowing the donor the time and our curated insights into the field to decide which of these four impact categories that we're talking about most interests them in the beginning and middle and end of their giving plan. And so um, this is our strategy for using Tim's very uh, ingenious, uh, you know, uh, flexible structure here, which is allowing us to prove as a use case that there is signal in this market. It's in a number of different categories. And there are some uh, substantial um, uh, targets for investment that will create traditional risk adjusted returns. There are other targets of investment intentionally in this portfolio. Um, where traditional capital ha ha has not gone. There are some things in the portfolio that would look very traditionally like philanthropic allocations of capital to, to nonprofits. But everything that we are procuring in the menu uh, from around the world is geared and catered towards those impact, those reportable, measurable impact criteria that really are about building participation in this changing knowledge-based economy <laughs> in the kinds of jobs that are you know, going to advance workers into uh, upward mobility. And I have to say, you know, uh, coming from my previous life, um, when you evaluate under a microscope the public spend on workforce training, we spend a uh, high volume, multi-billions of dollars on, uh, on um, workforce development without regard to the measurable outcome of those services, particularly as it relates to the disability market. And many, many, many folks uh, around the world are cheering us on because we're adding a disciplined <laughs> integrity to, to wanting to measure the outcome uh, and the re interrelationship between charity and driving economic participation. That's great. And uh, it's sort of like a uh, going to be big acumen fund in a bottle. You know? It's like you've got all these diverse donors coming in and deploying it. Um, Derek, let me switch over to you and walk us through a bit of about what uh, Hometown Fund and I Am Nation is up to. After you unmute. Or we could switch to John next. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, there you are, Derek. Gotcha. Me? Okay. Can you uh, start that over, Tim? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you for the last. I was just, I was just uh, inviting you to sort of walk, walk through uh, the I Am Nation yeah. hometown yeah. fund model and, and, and sort of the work of, of the, uh, the pool fund initiative and the network that you're building and, and kind of how it applies to this conversation. Tim, I'm not picking you up. Maybe go to John and then I'll try to get the tech stuff worked out on my side, but I'm not hearing that. Okay, we'll switch to John. I heard went away. Uh, to talk about carbon, to uh, talk about carbonware labs. Um, John, why don't you give us a. Uh, you, you sound great, Eric. So I can hear yeah. you, John. Like okay, you. well, you sound great. So why don't you go ahead? I, I promise, I think everyone else can hear you. Maybe you just can't hear Tim. Yeah, um, I'm assuming. We're, we're talking. I didn't get the 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 queue up, but um, basically, we've been um, I've been talking with Impact Assets and Tim um, for maybe just under a year now. Uh, I've personally had some experience with donor advised funds um, just throughout my my time in the league and looking at different ways to be more intentional um, with how I allocate my money, how I strategically invest it, um, and 
over the last nine months or so, been really putting the, down the groundwork for uh, our community that, that we've launched called I Am Nation. And essentially what I Am Nation represents is a community of business-minded, entrepreneurial-minded, professional athletes that uh, really have ambitions beyond the game. Um, believe it or not, when you're in a locker room, you're sitting right next to your teammates, um, but you're hyper-focused on, on a result and a goal week to week, you know, Sunday, Monday, whatever you play, who's your opponent, what is their scheme, how can you attack them, what are their weaknesses, and you're collaborating on that. Um, but a lot of the times you don't get to talk about other things outside of that realm. So I may not know that my teammate is investing in, you know, multifamily real estate or this guy is looking at venture deals and we just don't have that environment that is conducive to, to sharing ideas and collaborating. And, you know, I just, I feel it is such of a missed opportunity because when do you get that much social influence and financial, um, you know, influence and wealth in a room where you're not doing anything but going out and, and, and playing with a pigskin? Like for me, that's, that's a missed opportunity. And I think a lot of the guys, we find ourselves in silos a lot of the times um, and we're just kind of off in our silo doing our own thing, but a lot of us have similar interests. And I think that there's a really a powerful element of a collective um, moving together with intentionality. And so what I Am Nation has rep, you know, basically laid the, the, the foundation for is um, a, a means to organize professional athletes and to become a resource platform of sorts um, where, where guys are trying to get you know, education on different things, whether it's investments or how to be, you know, more intentional with their philanthropic uh, efforts and how could we collectively, um, you know, collaborate amongst uh, ourselves. And so when we started talking uh, with, with Impact Assets around, you know, how can we get creative with deploying capital, with leveraging resources, um, we started to go down this lane of, okay, look, let's, let's create a, a mechanism for our members to a not only contribute money towards, but to essentially come alongside of you know players' causes. So if there's a, a you, know, you know we call it the hometown fund. A lot of us come from areas that are underserved, overlooked, um, that don't get a lot of attention, but that need investment, that need intentionality, um, and need a lot of work. And so, for example, I'm from a place called Coatesville, Pennsylvania. It's an old steel town outside of Philadelphia. Um, still the, the economy came and went with the steel industry. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. And a lot of the times it may not be uh, a market rate deal that's going to work in an area like this. So you have to become creative with how you put together, uh, if we're talking about real estate, how, how we put together capital stacks, right? Because there's got to be some soft money that's involved uh, in these projects to make them all come together financially. And so having, a, 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 you know, an asset like, a, you know, a donor advised fund, more specifically a hometown fund where we could say to our members, hey, look, you want to go back into your hometown and eliminate food deserts? OK, great. We have a we have an asset for you. We have a tool for you to come alongside you and, and help you achieve your goals and accomplish um, what you're striving to accomplish. And it's a really creative source of capital that can be deployed on, like you said, Tim, at the beginning, it's very flexible, right? And so a lot of our members have this, this desire to go back. And, and, and I, I always talk about it like we, we do football camps, right? We do back to school drives and those things are great, but how do we take it to the next level? How do we uh, create a new playbook for players to go back to their hometowns, the places they live, the places they, they come from, and to really deploy creative uh, capital for 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 causes that they that they feel strongly about, and so I'm I'm really excited about the partnership that that we've established, and we're we're early on, but I think that there's a lot of runway for us, and really to create a model of sorts so that we can exemplify and point to to say, look, here's a way that you can really make change and and, and do some meaningful things. And I think it's really exciting too that you're you're sort of working on the amplification model of 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 all the fans and the, and the folks who care about the players too. So there's like, it's, it's got a whole, a whole sort of network play uh, that's really distributed and I think powerful and, and pretty unique. So uh, we're really excited by, uh, as we've learned more and more about what you're up to. Uh, John, why don't you hop in and, and completely different, you know, you're coming from a completely different place right? with, with uh, decarbonizing what you're interested in decarbonizing. Why don't you tell us about that and, and how you've been thinking about um, the fund? 
Absolutely. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. I, so I, one of the problems that the world's focused on right now is decarbonizing um, the global economy or really actually ensuring that you know, by 2050, we're no longer adding any more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, which is an enormous task. And it's actually um, scarier than many tasks because every week you delay and every you know, gram of carbon dioxide you put in the atmosphere today is one less that you can put in of tomorrow and your path there. It's not just that you, you know, I, I have to get there by 2050, but nature already passed a balanced budget amendment on the carbon budget. And so um, uh, one of the interesting things that's happened though, is that um, a very small portion, there was a recent study that came out, um, a very small portion of uh, the world's uh, uh, philanthropic uh, money is uh, spent on uh, on climate. And in large part, that's because I, I, it's very difficult to know exactly uh, what to do. Um, and uh, though there's a great number of sustainability uh, uh, initiatives and you know, ESG investing has taken huge steps forward, um, how to actually deploy um, the world's philanthropic effort against what is not only uh, critical for you know, uh, creating a, a livable planet, but also um, from a justice perspective, because those who will be you know, hurt the worst by I, 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 by I, I, you know, worsening in climate are um, those who are uh, underrepresented, and so uh, it's uh, I, you know, it's a it's a terrific problem. What we did um, was to set out to figure out where we could help unlock uh, uh, the the barriers to uh, decarbonization. So we think of it as there being three components, um, one of which is technological. Um, that's where we started. I was the the CTO at Wayfair, and I've been a you know a serial tech uh, entrepreneur. Um, and involved with a number of other companies like uh, Bombas and, and and a few others that um, I, I have I've been very successful I, I at uh, um, at creating change. But this is a, you know a really different question. So there's you know technical question: How do you do carbon dioxide removal? How do you create substitutes for high carbon products that we all consume every day? How do you create complements um, for a you know for a low carbon future? What does a you know future low low carbon world look like from a technical perspective? Well, that's one. You know, barrier. But there's another barrier, which is really governmental, um, as I think anyone who's watching DC uh, this week is, is is well aware. And there's another that underscores that, which is political, which is how do we actually, um, you know, create the will, uh, um, the political will to you know support um, truly uh, the changes that need to uh, be made in order to have a low carbon future. Um, and I like to describe that as you know the creation of the single issue decarbonization voter. Um, uh, which is there are very few of I, I, as of uh, I, as of today, um, and I think for understandable reasons because it's so challenging to explain all of these uh, complex issues. So where we started was really as um, I, you know with that uh, first pillar uh, with a technical I, I statement to say we were going to be a VC. When I started this two years ago, um, there was a gap. Uh, climate technology uh, ventures were underfunded. Um, and uh, oh, how times have changed in the past two years. Uh, there is more money flowing into climate tech um, than I, I've ever seen go into uh, a space which is based on uh, 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 a, you know, a presumed future move by governments to make carbon scarce or expensive, right? Um, these companies won't actually, uh, you know, a lot of them will not make a terrible amount of money um, and won't, certainly won't achieve venture returns unless government acts. Um, and so we've uh, we've moved, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. But we've moved um, from being uh, what was really going to be a philanthropic VC um, into being a catalyst uh, for uh, action on both the governmental and uh, and political. So now a lot of the work we're doing um, is to uh, work with NGOs and think tanks on projects to envision what a low carbon uh, future will look like from a, an agency perspective. Um, in DC and uh, and globally, and we're putting together uh, plans for legislation and uh, actual uh, uh, prototypes, really, of uh, what agencies will look like that will enable a, a low carbon economy and a low carbon future, and what intergovernmental um, uh, cooperation will look like. So that's really a policy act, and then uh, what's much more nascent is the um, uh, political, and I don't mean from a 501c4, but I mean actually from a you know uh, from a tax deductible, an issue advocacy uh, orientation. Um, the question of how do you actually create affiliation groups um, that are focused on um, the creation of uh, voting blocks that will uh, uh, that will support um, these low carbon futures uh, uh, within government. So really, um, those are the uh, those are the three legs. Um, you know, uh, to this point. 
Um, I actually, I, I started with uh, a number of other tech founders who, uh, you know, the family offices and others, uh, I, you know, who I know, uh, who have been able to um, help me uh, raise the um, the initial uh, catalytic capital. Um, but really more and more what I'm doing is actually, uh, when I say catalyst, I truly mean it. Um, I'm helping create shovel-ready projects, not physical shovel-ready, but actual policy shovel-ready projects, um, and uh, helping uh, uh, money move directly from foundations, from um, both family foundations and foundations proper, um, to these uh, NGOs and policy shops um, to, uh, uh, to do the advocacy work. And so while I often put up a bit of my own uh, money, actually very, I, I very often don't have to spend it because what I've done is I've catalyzed um, a connection between these NGOs uh, and uh, uh, traditional funding organizations. And so I'm doing, trying to do my bit um, to help uh, uh, begin to move the needle on what I started with, that question of why so little philanthropic money was going into truly climate-related uh, uh, spending. So uh, anyway, we've uh, we've changed quite a bit, um, but uh, we've maintained our focus on really the goal line, um, I, I, which is that you know, 2050 balanced budget and um, getting all the way there. And uh, the three uh, the three pillars we started with, and we've shifted over time in terms of um, actually what we're doing. And it's been a short time. So I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm used to shifting uh, pretty fast. And the structure is actually uh, pretty remarkable because it's enabled me to do that. Um, and I, I focus much more on impact than uh, I would if I, I'd um, started a traditional um, organization, a traditional philanthropic organization, um, and that's been a huge asset to our ability to to, to uh, move quickly and, and achieve things. Yeah, I was really, uh, I mean, I thought that was really noteworthy just in our work uh, watching you evolve in the early, you know, in the early months here is is to see how you you weren't locked into you know the way it was supposed to be and had to set up all these systems and infrastructure that that only worked one way and so i think that that as you i think just alluded to you know one of the advantages of this sort of asset light if you will kind of platform architecture is that you you don't have to be right necessarily all, all you know from the get-go not that we're ever, any of us are ever that right at the get-go but you know but the cost of the switching costs the and then also the inertia and the you know that that sort of that that feeling like you have to keep going down a train track because you put the train on that track uh i think you've been really um you know really uh exemplary and just and just rolling with the punches of what you're you're learning as you go um and i think that's a testament to you know not just the initiative but also to the the, the good fit on the architecture um do you, just just a, little, a question of just in terms of um where where do you see this going i mean you sort of alluded to it in the in some of the pivoting you've been doing but like when you look out three to five years what if, if relative to this initiative and sort of the resources you want to bring and, and how you want to kind of interventionally focus them more and more surgically to higher impact like what's where do you at what, what's success for carbon Ware labs so I mean, success in terms of outcomes would actually be, you know, government legislation, which enshrines these nationally defined contributions um, in uh, in law. Um, that's a huge lift, right? And so that maybe that's not a two, three, you know, a year goal. Maybe that's a five year goal or a ten year goal. Um, but uh, what I see is the creation of all of the pieces that would enable that to be right. So the people can actually um, say it would go from that's a you know that's a huge abstraction to actually I understand what the you know what the government agencies look like and they. Um, exist on paper and uh, people have, you know, fine-tuned um, how they work. And so uh, to the extent that, you know, I, I, that we can I, I create that through uh, creating ongoing uh, uh, activities, really, uh, you know, active programs um, within a number of these uh, think tanks that have done analogous work in tax policy or urban renewal um, and actually, you know, have them have large decarbonization programs. We can catalyze that. Um, then I'll have succeeded. So, in a sense, there's a there's a future that I'd be very very happy with, where we have a staff, where we actually, in, you know, establish, uh, you know, ourselves as a proper philanthropy and are um, helping uh, shepherd funds around. There's a path in which we no longer exist, in which I'd be very happy with, in which um, the organizations that are best suited to do this work. Um, have uh, uh, taken the reins and, and, are, and, and are actively uh, pursuing it. And I'm really happy with either outcome. I care much more about the, um, the goal line than what the, you know, um, the labs in our, uh, in, our, in our name is incredibly intentionally chosen um, because we're experimenting. And um, I, it may very well be that, you know, I, uh, we have the opportunity to, um, to create 
um, large scale ongoing uh, programs at uh, organizations that um, have had tremendous impact in a number of other domains. Uh, and that we, we we're no longer needed, and then I can go on to the next project, and that would be great. Um, uh, and uh, if it you know if it if it happens that um, there's an active uh, shepherding uh, process or a ongoing catalytic um, innovation process that needs to happen, then that that would be terrific too. But I'm you know I'm 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 deferring judgment until you know until I, until I see what's needed. Mm -hmm. um, Gina, you said something when. Uh, when you were walking through your model about, and which I'd love to hear just a little bit more depth about, like walk us through that customized sort of programming process for a minute of like, like institutional donor shows up, they want to take a position in smart job fund. They, uh, they, they look at your, you know, your portfolio, so to speak. Like, how do you get from that point to them? I don't know, through the first cycle if you could do that kind of quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that um, what we're offering is very unique, not only to the United States, but to the world. In essence, you're allowing us, Tim, through the flexibility, and I really liked the way John was noting this ability to adjust the way that we, we are um, sort of improving the baseline of what a normal charitable contribution process is is that we're testing a market in the process. We together with our donors in partnership are finding signal in this untapped market. And we're doing it because we firmly believe there's tremendous potential in this market, but also because we have to as a condition precedent to moving forward to commercializing this market further um, and, and mainstreaming uh, these investment opportunities. The donor is coming to us and like many other folks, this might be their first entree to the disability market, or it might not. But we, the uniqueness of the pooled fund is allowing them to uh, it, the the latitude for experimentation along with us, where we are um, procuring the opportunity for immediate tax deductible uh, charitable contribution, and then a long term planning strategy as to where they uh, among our four impact categories are allocating, you know, the recommendation for allocation of capital doesn't need, doesn't need to be made all at once on day one and can actually um, sort of cross instruments and levels of risk over time, which is a very unique and interesting strategy. So in terms of instruments, you know, uh, it, it, we're allocating, we're making recommendations to allocate grad capital to accelerators and incubators, but we might also be making a, a recommendation. Our donors might be interested in making available revenue-based financing. They might be interested in making available um, uh, venture deals with, with early stage companies that are really working in work, the next generation of really transformative workplace technologies. And so that flexibility comes with a long-term planning strategy that's much like a portfolio as opposed to a check-the-box charitable contribution. I think quite, quite a number of people in, in the DAP space have spent a lot of time sort of seeing it as transactional. You know, we, we are uh, sort of guiding our funds towards, you know, this particular charity and we're seeing it less transactional and more relationship building with our donors that we're in this together um, to build this market and to explore new and interesting terrain within that market. And that means that it, there's a learning process. It's iterative, but we're providing ready to go. I love John's use of the word shovel ready. You know, we've got shovel ready uh, opportunities but we've got curated insight into the disability market. We've, we're building a relationship with donors where we're explaining the impact and we're explaining the value proposition of these technologies, of these pro, uh, you know programmatic opportunities and entrepreneurship building. And so um, what we're seeing is an experience for the donors. It's an experience to learn about the market with us and also drive impact. The unique thing is that you can to dip your toe into higher and higher levels of risk over time. And I think the more that our donors are socialized to how really revolutionary some of these early stage companies are that are higher risk uh, capital bets, um, the more they, they would like to realign their portfolio strategy from mostly allocating grant capital 
to uh, really trying to diversify and look at that evergreen, evergreen early stage investing in some of these technology companies. That's great. Um, I just, if people have a couple questions they wanna throw in the chat, happy to, to pick them off and, and feed them in. We've got five minutes left, so we're gonna you know, kind of burn towards the finish line here. But uh, Derek, what, do you see an interconnectivity from these hometown, you know, from the, from the different cities of kind of focus or do they, re, are they each really kind of like their own little microcosm? I, I mean, I, it, cause I can see with a sort of the national IM nation network that there'd be opportunity to kind of go sort of macro big with this story, but maybe you lose this, the, the intensity of the focus. I, have you all been wrestling with that or do you have a, uh, kind of the prog prognosis on where that ends up. Yeah, it's so it, it's on both sides of the spectrum of there are a lot of intricacies and nuances in your local, you know, ecosystems, right? So in my hometown, there's a big, big push for quality education. We're at the bottom 15% in the state. And so a lot of the efforts going toward education. Uh, in Nashville, there's a big deficiency of affordable housing units. So a lot of the push locally is around quality, affordable housing. And so I think that there are certain, you know, common denominators that you see in all of these markets, but depending on where you're at geographically and what the, the major pain points are, it, it depends and it dictates what the priorities are, you know, from a political, from a gra grassroots, you know. So um, I think a lot of it is really just finding what aligns with, with your passion and like, where do you feel yourself gravitating towards? Right. So for me, it's like, it's the economics of like, you know, affordable housing, getting access to capital to minority entrepreneurs um, and all the things that kind of fall within, within that. And so there are some overarching themes that could, you know, en encompass a lot of the issues that we see. Um, but we essentially try to align the efforts with the passions of our members. And, and if somebody's going to be a lead on an initiative or a partner with an initiative, we want that to be very authentic and genuine to them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, oh, so Harold asks, it's a cool to find how do you input the specific desires, donor advice aspect of the original donor, or do you ensure that the donors just buy into the overall thesis that you put forwards like i mean regina gina you you already sort of answered this like it's both and like you can do deep customization donor by donor but you can also let them buy into to the pool i mean john i'm not sure how it applies exactly if you have a, a, a comment on that uh, or sure i mean I, I, briefly I, I i i really ask for discretion um that folks who you know buy into the pooled fund are um, trust me and they understand the exact dynamic that we've used to allocate. They understand the KPIs we're shooting for and they understand the mechanics and themes. And so, but I, like I said, more often than not, I'm actually now directing, directly connecting uh, investment vehicles or really, you know, I, 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 uh, philanthropies with donors who weren't aware that they could um, spend their, their money. And to me, to me, that makes me very happy because that sets them on the path to actually having an ongoing program fund um, that can be very successful. I, you know, in an ideal world, I can continue to innovate and I can um, help uh, lay the track for uh, really successful ongoing programs that I don't need to be in the middle of. That's great. Well, I would, uh, I know that we have uh, run towards the top of the hour. I, we have uh, pasted all the contact information on the websites of all four of us. And I think the, the call to action is come ask us your questions. Give us your ideas. Connect us to your networks. Um, happy to, you know, to give free consults out on on how this model might apply to you. Um, I do think, you know, in, in sort of wrapping up here, that the the punchline here is that there's this is just sort of a, a new way of thinking about organizing a value chain that doesn't have all the normal barriers to uh, to participation, to inclusion, to going out on the deep end of the pool, maybe faster with less surety. So this is kind of like an innovation edge, I think that is uniquely suited to donor advised funds. I wish there was a lot more of it going on. This is not an impact assets only thing at all. We're just kind of, you know, at that edge innovating a bit here. Um, but I think that, you know, Tides Foundation and others have, have played around with some of these models too. I wanna acknowledge that, you know, 
it, it, we're just sort of reorganizing the palette from which you paint pictures. But I think that there's, as you can see here, there's such a, a plurality of ways to to make use of this kind of thinking, and hopefully it inspired some of uh, you on the on the line there to to think a little differently about what's possible. And really thank you, Gina, and John, and Derek for your impressive work and for lending us your time and, and thoughts today. So thank you, uh, and thanks to SoCap. Thank you.